So I'm here today to talk about building peer-to-peer -peer apps, and specifically to talk about building peer-to-peer -peer apps with the Beaker browser. Now, there's a lot in my talk title that's worth clarifying, but before I dive into the details, I want to share a little bit about myself and what my interest in this topic is. So I'm Tara Vansel, and I'm a web developer, as I'm sure many of you in this room are too. And there are probably a hundred different ways to be a web developer, but for me what that means is I really love building things, and I think the web is a phenomenal tool for building with. Outside of the web, I love anything to do with nails or nail art, and I'm also a huge Beyonce fan. Her artistry inspires so much of my work. Now, the web is a huge part of my life now, but that wasn't always the case. I actually didn't grow up online. Um, we didn't have a computer in my household until um, like halfway through I was high school. And when I finally did get online, I pretty much just used it for looking at pictures of the boy I had a crush on and catching up on the book that I didn't read for English class. So my online experiences were very much about consuming things. I didn't have any uh, idea that I could build things on the web. In fact, I assumed that building websites and apps was reserved for people like Mark Zuckerberg. So when I eventually learned about the existence of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, it was a really exciting moment for me. Um, it totally changed how I thought I could participate on the web. And um, it's not an overstatement to say that it was mind-blowing for me. So I started building things, and I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I loved that I could write HTML in my text editor, and I could see the output of my work in a familiar environment, the browser. I had been using a browser all along. I, I knew how to work with a browser. I love that I could build an application, and it would be accessible by anybody, no matter what browser they preferred to use. And eventually, I learned to love the web for what it was in principle. And if you think about it, the web is kind of like humanity's shared language for building stuff. And I think that's pretty cool. And we're all here because we have some intuition about what makes the web special. But I think it's helpful and important to clarify exactly what makes the web so special. And I like to break it down into these three properties. I like to say that the web is open, meaning that it's not owned by anybody. You don't have to pay a licensing fee to Oracle in order to participate on the web. And even though some entities have outsized influence on how the web works, in theory, anybody can participate in the web standards process and shape how the web works. I like to say that the web is decentralized, meaning that anyone can have a website. There's no central organization that decides who can or cannot have a website. As long as you're willing to speak HTML and JavaScript and CSS, go ahead. You can put up a website. And lastly, the web is shared. It doesn't belong to the United States or Spain or France. It belongs to whoever decides to participate in it. Um, and because it is a collective project, we have a collective responsibility to maintain and improve it. Now, if you haven't guessed already, I'll say it outright, I love the web. I think it's super cool. Um, and as much as I love the web, I also understand that the web is imperfect. It has flaws, and that's totally OK. When you consider that the web is a humanity-sized effort to agree on technical decisions, it's kind of a miracle that we have something that works at all. So I'm willing to accept a few flaws. But we should also keep in mind that the web is so young. Tim Berners-Lee created the first web browser. It was called WorldWideWeb.app in 1990. That was only 28 years ago. And yes, a lot has happened in those 28 years. Um, but if things work out well, the web should be around for much, much longer than 28 years from now. So I think it's important that we ask ourselves, how are we going to shape the web for the next 30 years and beyond? What values are we going to try to uphold with the web? And what new capabilities are we going to give to the next generation of builders? I take this question pretty seriously because I genuinely believe that the web is one of the most amazing creations humanity has ever done. Um, and I think it's important for us to take this responsibility really seriously. 
Um, and of course, the first step towards improving anything is to identify what's broken. And so if you'll allow me, I would like to share my top three complaints about the web. And I want to warn you, I'm not going to propose any solutions yet. I'm just going to complain. So please bear with me. <laughs> first, servers suck. Um, now, I don't want to offend anyone here, because I'm sure there are people in this room who work with servers for a living, and you probably enjoy it. Uh, but let me explain why I think servers suck. So I started building things on the web in an interesting time period. It was the sweet spot when GeoCities had already been shut down. So for those of you who don't know about GeoCities, it was this online community where you could build a website inside of your browser and publish it from your browser. Um, and people loved this. There were millions and millions of websites published with GeoCities. But it got shut down. And it was a really sad moment for the web. And so I got online after that happened. And before services like Netlify, Now, and Glitch existed. So I was having fun building all these projects and websites and apps. But I still needed a way to deploy those. And as far as I could tell, the best option I had was to figure out how to run a server. And I wasn't terribly excited about that prospect, but I did it. I learned how to work with Heroku and AWS. It was painful. Um, and even though I'm a lot better at working with servers these days, I don't particularly enjoy it. I much prefer the art of designing and building and crafting things with the web. It, that's my strength. And I think there are a lot of people like that. A lot of people who are perfectly capable building and programming on the web, but maybe they don't have the time, the money, or the expertise to run a server. And I think this is supported by the fact that we're seeing services like NeoCities and Glitch do so well today. Um, Glitch is doing amazingly, I think, because people love that it allows you to publish a website or an app with just one click. Um, and so I think we should take notice of this. I think we should say, huh, you know, maybe the web isn't actually very good at enabling publishing and deploying. Maybe there's room for improvement there. And I, I personally think there is. OK, my second complaint about the web is that apps aren't customizable. Well, what do I mean by that? Apps are embedded into every part of our life. We use them for um, our banking. We use them for connecting with our family and our friends. We use them for our professional lives. Yet, when it comes to web apps, we have very little say over influencing how they work. Um, if anyone uses Instagram, you've probably longed for a chronological feed. I know I do. I do sometimes like this jumbled feed, but also sometimes I just want a chronological feed. And there's not much I can do to get that. I, I can't use a web extension to fix this. Um, I just kind of have to deal with it. And that bums me out. Um, I also love Twitter. I, uh, Twitter's the reason I'm on this stage in the first place. It's how I met a lot of web developers and was able to share my work. But I've been pretty frustrated with Twitter lately for a dozen different reasons. Um, most recently, Twitter has shared that they're exploring a new feature called Presence, which would tell other Twitter users when you're online and when you're offline. Now, this could be useful in some cases, but for me, it is, that is not how I want to engage on Twitter. Um, in fact, it would probably drive me away from Twitter. And I find it kind of sad that even though I love Twitter, the platform, so much, I don't have any way to actually shape how it works. Now, chronological feeds and presence may seem like minor features. They're really not that important in the grand scheme of things. But when you step back and you look at the big picture, we really, as users, have no way to shape the little things or the big and meaningful things, because our online experiences are defined by corporations. Um, and when I think about the longevity of the web, I'm not so sure I like this. I'm not so sure that I'm willing to trust corporations with the next 30, 60, or 100 years of the web. I kind of think it'll work out a little bit better if we, as the people who use the web, have some ability to customize the apps that we depend on for everything. The last thing, the last complaint I have about the web is, is that it's too hard to connect. 
What in the world do I mean by that? Well, this one's sort of related to my first two complaints. What I mean is that it's too hard for developers like you and me to build applications that connect users. And when you look at all the different kinds of apps that we use, chat applications, social media, photo sharing, so many of these apps are about taking two people and connecting them in some way. So it's a pretty fundamental thing to connect people on the web. Um, let's look at this example. This is, let's say this is Slack, and you're trying to send a message to your friend to ask if they want drinks later. First, I would send the message to Slack, and Slack server would then pass that message on to my friend. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with this architecture. It works pretty well, actually. But what would the web look like, and what would it feel, uh, feel like to build applications if the web platform itself made this a little bit easier? What if the web itself made it easy to send a message directly from one person to another? I personally think this is way too hard on the web right now, and I think a lot of our, uh, the problems we're seeing on the web today stem from this difficulty. OK, so in summary, my three complaints about the web are that servers suck, we can't customize apps, and it's too hard to build apps that connect people together. So it's probably about time that I stop complaining and start offering some solutions. <laughs> um, and this is where my work on the Beaker browser comes in. Um, Beaker is an experimental browser. Um, our experiment is motivated very deeply by the complaints that I just presented a moment ago. Um, and I work on it with these two guys, P. Frazee and Mafintosh. Um, if you've ever used a node module, you've probably used uh, some of Mafintosh's code. He's one of those prolific Node.js authors. Um, and we were motivated to build Beaker because we love the web, first of all, and second of all, we wanted to help improve it. And we saw a few paths forward for helping to improve the web. We could have gone and got a job with my, uh, Firefox or Microsoft Edge or Chrome, or we could have somehow gotten involved into the web standards processes. But the ideas that we had about how to improve the web were honestly a little bit wacky and far off, and we weren't, we weren't sure that um, our ideas would be well received in those venues. So we thought, you know, why don't we just make a browser and run these weird experiments and just see what happens? And that's what we did. And the core experiment we're running in Beaker is what happens if you put a peer-to-peer -peer protocol in the browser? And more specifically, how does that change how we build websites and apps? Well, I think to answer that question, I first have to tell you what a peer-to-peer -peer protocol is. Um, and I think the best way to do that is actually to contrast it with a client-server files protocol. So a good example of a client-server protocol is HTTP, which I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with. And this is actually pretty easy to understand. You have a client, like a browser, that makes a request to a server and says, hey, do you have the cat.png file? And the server says, yep, here it is, and sends it back to the client. Now, a peer-to-peer -peer protocol um, works kind of like it sounds. You have a bunch of participants or peers on a network, and when one of the peers requests a file, it asks the whole network. And anybody who has that file can send it back to them. So it has this neat effect where these regular devices, whether they're laptops, desktop computers, or phones, can actually help to host files and step in to do the sorts of things that servers normally do. Um, and I love this because it kind of makes hosting a communal effort. Um, it, it, it reduces the burden and the cost of having to run a server and makes, makes publishing files a lot cheaper than it would be in a client-server model. <clears throat> uh, and the peer-to-peer -peer protocol that we use in Beaker is called DAT. And I just wanted to give them a shout out because they're a really fantastic group of people. They're a nonprofit, so if you work at an organization that might be interested in supporting um, the sustainability of an open source protocol, I would definitely check DAT out. I can endorse them wholeheartedly. So let's get back to this question. How might a peer-to-peer -peer protocol change how we build on the web? Would it make servers suck less? Might apps become customizable? 
Might it be a little bit easier to build apps that connect real users? Um, well, I think at this point, uh, the, the best thing I can do is show you Beaker and see if we can start answering these questions. OK, so forgive me if the URL bar is a little bit small. I think this is the best I can do here. But this is Beaker. It's a browser. It should look and feel pretty much like the browsers that you're used to seeing. It has a new tab page and a URL bar. And you can even open um, HTTPS pages. We haven't blocked off the traditional web just yet. So why don't I show you a peer-to-peer -peer website? This is the Beaker website. And one of the first things you might notice is that it doesn't have an HTTPS URL. It has a DAT URL. And again, that's, that's the peer-to-peer -peer protocol we use. And what this means is that I'm not downloading this website and its files from a server. I'm downloading it from the network. I'm downloading it from whoever, is, whoever else is visiting this website currently. Uh, it looks like nobody else is visiting this website. We're, <laughs> we're not very popular. Um, and it works just like you would expect a website to. Uh, we have image tags. Links work just like they do on the web that you know and love. And that's kind of the whole point. We didn't want to break the web. We just wanted to take the web and tweak it a little bit and see what happens. So one of my favorite features about Beaker is that if you really like a website, you can choose to contribute resources to help keep it online. So I've actually chosen to seed this website forever. Um, you could toggle that down to a month, a week, or a day. It's up to you. I'm going to stick with forever because I really like this, this website. OK, so if you can host other people's websites, what's to stop you from being able to host your own website on this peer-to-peer -peer network? Well, nothing. And this is one of the coolest features in Beaker. You can actually create a website from Beaker and host it directly from the browser. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to open the main menu and click Create New. And we've got three options here. We can create an empty project. We can import an existing website. But I'm actually going to use this template just for the sake of convenience. And when I click this button, Beaker is going to create a new website just like that. So it'll, it'll happen pretty fast. OK, so we've created a new website. And this is actually the view source of Beaker. So let me give this website a title. And let's open up the website and see what it looks like. It's a pretty boring website. <laughs> it's just a little static site that um, doesn't do much except lets you change the background color. But let's jump back over to the view source and take a look. So as you would expect, you can view the source of any given file on, in the website. Um, but even cooler, you can edit files. So let's open the editor for this index.html. And let's edit the h1 tag. I'm going to say, hello, Barcelona. And when we save this and go back and refresh, we see the change. OK, um, I'm going to turn on live reloading. Beaker has a built-in live reloading tool. And we're developers, and I'm sure a lot of you have preferences about your code, coding environment, your text editor. And you can totally use your preferred text editor with Beaker. Um, I'm just going to copy this website over to a directory on my device. And if I open it up in Sublime, let's see. I'm going to say, hello from Sublime. Once I save this, um, it should refresh automatically. Yeah, there we are. So we've edited it, the website. It's live reloading. This is pretty cool, huh? Um, it's just a static website. But I think what's important to notice is that there's no server involved here. I could share this URL with any of you. And if you open it up in Beaker, you'll download it directly from my computer. And to me, this really captures the spirit of what the web was supposed to be. It's supposed to be a platform that we can use to build and create and share. Um, I shouldn't have to set up a server just to send someone some files. That seems a little bit excessive. OK, so let's go back to our checklist here and see what we've been able to accomplish. Have we made it so that servers could suck, suck less? Um, 
Yes, I would argue that we have, or rather that we've made it so that maybe we don't need to depend on servers so much in order to build a website. OK, so let's visit these last two questions. Could we make it so that apps are customizable? And could we make it so that it might be easier to connect users? Let's see. Um, so before we answer those questions, I think we should reflect a little bit about what even is an app. And when you talk about web apps, it's kind of a blurred line between a website and a web app, right? Because a web app is just a website that has more functionality than other websites. It might do things like store data. It might manage user profiles or preferences. And of course, it's going to probably need to update data. And the way that we do this on the web today is with post requests, typically. Uh, you run a server that has an endpoint. And if you want to update a piece of data, you make a post request to that endpoint. And then your database handles the, the request and um, updates your record. And that works fine. But again, it requires running a server. And that's just sort of a pain. The way we do this on the peer-to-peer -peer web and in Beaker is a little bit different. It kind of flips the idea of databases on its head and says, hey, wait, what about just storing data in websites themselves? I mean, websites are made of files. We can store data in files. Like, How far can we go with just using websites to store data? And so this is an example that uses Beaker's APIs to get an instance of my website. Um, it creates a profile. And it's going to write the, file, uh, write the profile data to a file called profile.json. So this, this write file method, I like to think of it as a way to uh, write records in a database. And if this isn't making sense, I think I'll just show you how this works in a, in a simple example. So I'm going to open up the console here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new file in this website that we made earlier. Um, I'm just going to create an HTML file for the sake of an example. So I'm going to start by getting an instance of this website. And what this gives us is an object that has access to all of Beaker's peer-to-peer -peer APIs. And now I'm going to use this to write a new file. I'm going to call it um, fullstackfest.html. And I'm just going to write a simple message, hi. OK. And it refreshed because I forgot to turn off live reloading. So why don't I do that real quick? And then we'll go back to the terminal. Um, let me double check. Ah, I need to start over because live reloading got rid of our reference. OK. So we wrote the file. Um, if all went well, there should be a new file at fsf.html. And we can actually use Beaker's APIs to check that. Uh, as you might be able to guess, we have a read file method. So we can say site.readfile. And it's going to return a promise. So I'm actually going to console.log the output. And there we go. We can see in the console that it indeed did write the word hi to the file. And we could also confirm that by just visiting the file. There we are. OK, so like, that's cool, right? Um, but it's not all the, that exciting. That's just a static website. What about an actual app that does something? How, how, how do these APIs factor into apps? Let me show you an application called Fritter. Fritter is an example application that we made to really test the limits of these APIs and see how far we could get building something that people might actually want to use. Um, as you might guess, this is inspired heavily by Twitter. It is a microblogging app. And I'm not actually Beyonce. I know it's, it's hard to believe. We look so much alike, and we're both very good uh, dancers and singers. This is just my test profile. Um, and the way this application works is that it takes my profile, and it aggregates it into a nice view using the Beaker APIs. So this is what a profile looks like on Fritter. It's just a website. And every user has their own website that represents their profile. There's a metadata file that contains a person's name, their bio. And it also tells 
the application who they follow so that the application can then use um, Beaker's APIs to, uh, to, to fetch the, the feeds of other people and render it into a view. Um, let me show you my posts, because I think that's kind of interesting, too. This is what a post looks like. It's just a JSON file that contains a text property and a created at timestamp. And again, this is uh, the Fritter application uses this to render views. OK, so one of my favorite things about Fritter and this, this architecture for building applications is that the application is completely separate from the data. Um, normally, when you think about applications on the web, the, the user profile belongs to some server in the cloud. And that server is responsible for maintaining, uh, maintaining that, that profile. Um, but because we separated the application from the data, we're able to do some really cool things. Let's say I don't like rounded buttons, and I really prefer square corners. Well, Beaker has a feature that allows you to take any website or any application and make an editable copy of it. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole process right now. But I could go and I could make a uh, change to the CSS of this application, or I could change it even more substantially. And I could continue using my profile. I could continue following the same people that I've already followed. I wouldn't need to give up my, my content, my likes, or my network. Um, so here we, there you go. You've got customizable apps. We've, we've checked off number two. And so the last thing that we were trying to accomplish is to see, can we make it easier for developers to build apps that connect users? Well, this is an application that is all about connection, right? It's probably the most connected kind of app you can get. It's social media. So how does this work? How is it that because I fo follow Paul, I'm able to get his, um, get his posts? Well, if we go back and look at when I explained how a peer-to-peer -peer protocol works, if you just look at this graphic, you can see that it's already a very connected kind of protocol. By default, peer-to-peer -peer protocols are good at connecting people. So with Beaker, we don't really have to do all that much extra work to make it easy for developers to do that, because we're just piggybacking off of what the P2P protocol is really good at. In Beaker, the way this works is we've exposed an API called Watch, which basically lets you just take any URL on the DAT network and watch it for changes. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to set up a server that periodically pulls an endpoint for changes. You just use this API, and you get events when something changes, or if um, uh, there's an error with an update, you can respond to that as well. And that's exactly how this application works. If I were to follow someone, Fritter would basically just use that Watch API to start listening for changes to their uh, profile website. So I think we have started to address my three complaints about the web. And I hope that I've convinced you that there's at least some promise in peer-to-peer -peer protocols and that the web itself should really be thinking about um, the capabilities that peer-to-peer -peer protocols offer. Um, I'm really optimistic about the future of the web. I think it's just too good to let it fall to the wayside. Um, if you think so, too, I hope that you'll pester um, the other browser vendors to maybe start considering some of the ideas that we're exploring, um, because there's only three of us, and our voices aren't really loud enough to convince them. Um, thank you very much for listening. If you want to check out Beaker, you can install it on beakerbrowser.com. And I'll be around, so feel free to chat with me later. Thanks. So with your permission, I've collapsed some of the questions uh, to, to share with Tara. And then perhaps online, um, you might take a moment to go into a few more details. But if we could just, I'll, I'll just highlight two of the sort of areas people brought up. One had to do with when it's all decentralized, some of the, there's a couple of things that we've seen with other decentralized uh, apps that come up. There were some questions about, how do you redact something? If there's a mistake or something, you want to pull something off the web. Some of my old presentations, 2004 blog posts, how do you pull those back when it's all decentralized? Um, and in the same vein, um, something like GDPR, personal data gets on there. Um, how, is, how is that controlled? Can you just give us an, uh, sort of an outline of that? 
Yeah, it's a really important question. Um, and actually, I think the situation with decentralized protocols is not much different than what we have on the web right now. Because if I publish um, something, I've, I've accidentally published draft blog posts on my website before, and there's a good chance that it got crawled before I had, had a moment to take it down. And what do you do in that situation? You can put up some sort of request that tells crawlers, hey, this was a mistake. Can you maybe take that down? Don't cache that. Um, and that it's going to be the same story with peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Um, there, there will have to be some sort of tombstone marker that you can send out that is basically a request of the network to say, hey, please forget about this. Now, the problem with peer-to-peer -peer protocols is that you're depending on a l much larger crowd to respect your requests. And most likely, they probably won't. So we'll have to see how this plays out. And especially with regard to regulation like GDPR, I think this is completely uh, untread water. So we'll, we will see. So in other words, there's an opportunity for people who are really excited about this to come and, and get involved and solve some of these problems. Yes. Th there's a blank canvas. OK, another one, if I may, which is kind of related. Um, so we talked for a moment about you know, how do you pull stuff back? How do you control? The opposite. In a decentralized, some, sometimes with torrents and so on, something isn't popular. Maybe nobody wants to read my blog. I don't blame you. <laughs> um, and so nobody is replicating it or whatever the correct word is. Pardon me. Uh, this is all very new to me. How do we ensure that if this is built for peers, for, for, the, for the little person, that people get a chance to disseminate their, uh, their work across the, uh, across the network, even if they're not super popular? Yeah. So a peer-to-peer -peer network works really well when content is popular. And it's actually why it's so special, because if you have a video go viral, you really don't want to pay the bandwidth cost of that video going viral. And a peer-to-peer -peer network, again, helps um, distribute that cost. But in a situation where, like me, where my blog is not very popular, I still want my content to stay online so that when you know, one of you goes and visits one of my old blog posts, you can get it. We have this concept called a super peer. And a super peer is simply a node on the network that promises to stay online, to do a good job of being available. Now, these super peers don't have any special privileges like servers do today. All they do is make that promise. You send them a URL, send them the URL to your blog, and say, hey, I would really like you to keep this online. And maybe a super peer will offer that for free. Maybe they'll charge you a couple bucks a month. But I think it's a really interesting concept because Again, it has no special privileges. It's just making a promise. Yeah. Fantastic. Folks, what do you think? What do you think?